astronauts and cosmonauts, we've seen them train and study for years to enable these select people to work and live aboard the International Space Station. We have seen countless hours of their activities live on television and in the media. With this wealth of experience and insight behind them, what do they think when they return to Earth? Without exception, these spacefarers simply cannot wait to get back into space. Astronaut Paolo Nespoli is on his third space mission. It's what I call becoming an extraterrestrial person. You know, it's losing your Earthling uh, things and now you are really an extraterrestrial person because you don't think anymore about gravity, you don't think anymore about up or down. You think about what you need to do and position yourself so you can do it in the best way. You need to get used to working, to live first in space, being able to, vary, to be very confident uh, in the environment where you are. You need to uh, be able to learn to translate extremely efficiently without banging, banging into things. You need to be able to carry stuff. You need to be able to learn how to uh, move around and do things, uh, and how to sleep efficiently, how to work efficiently. And this takes like a month, a month and a half. So after that time, you are fully ready to work, and that's why six months, because you have the capability then of performing at 100% of your capabilities and then you know after six months I think people are ready to to go back to earth and you know taste again the food the smell the air see their friends their family for me it was an exhilarating experience I mean I found I found this uh, this thing of trying new things, uh, I find it really good. I, I, I felt I was like a little kid trying to, to do something, you know, try to get crazy and get inventive. And, and sometimes I thought, hmm, I should try something like that. And I said, ah, that's not possible. It's never going to work. And then you try it and you see that it opens up all sorts of other things that you never thought about it. And that it's a very good feeling. I mean, this feeling of, of, of uh, discovery. The astronaut in space is one of the resources of the space station and the control center want them to use as much as possible. So they have to make sure that they can work. In fact, we do work from 7.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the evening. That's the working day. And Houston and the other control center make sure that it's filled with activities. About 50% of that time is used for maintaining the station. We need to fix things. We need to move equipment. We need to change experiment. We need to load and unload the space spacecraft, we need to prepare for spacewalks. This is an important part. And then uh, another 30 to 40 percent is actually scientific work. I am a, an engineer, an aerospace engineer, but I will do uh, experiments that have to do with genetics, with medicine, with life science, with metallurgy. Uh, and we have a complex set of experiments spanning 360 degrees. Which is a sealed environment. I'm going to open up. It's a little bit going to school, yes. It's a little bit like the, the, the um, adrenaline that pumps in when you are in, a, in an exam and uh, you want to, from one side, you want to show off, you want to show what you, well, all the things that you know, in the other, in the other side, you need to be careful because uh, some of these uh, things can be very tricky and it's uh, easy to, uh, you know, misunderstand something or get in too much involved in one thing and forget about the other one. There are currently 16 active members of the ESA astronaut corps. Paolo is among the oldest. At 60, this is his third flight into space. 
I feel really honored to be able to fly in space again. It's a very nice experience for me. I'm looking forward to use all of this investment that the agency have made in the past year to qualify me, all, my, all the personal investment that I made in, 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 in get qualified and stay qualified and use it again, go to space and be useful. I mean, I, I, I will, I'm 60, but I'm, I'm going there and I'm expected to perform as anybody else and carry out my task and I'm looking forward to do what is needed and possibly a little bit more. Other ESA astronauts who have experienced their first missions in space are already in training for their next. Alexander Gerst has spent 165 days in orbit with six hours of EVA experience. Even though he is well aware of the amount of work and effort that lies ahead, he's keen to get back into space. It's a fantastic feeling to be back in training, of course. Uh, you, you can see the training facilities right behind me and uh, you can see why it's so interesting. I mean, this is like a, a full-on mock-up of the space station. So this is really the closest you can get on this planet to how the space station feels and looks like. And I've, of course, missed it a little bit after my last mission. Uh, I returned in 2014, that's three years ago. So uh, it feels great to be back in that, in that working mode. He'll certainly be continuing some of the research he started in orbit back in 2014. On top of this, he'll be fulfilling a new role, that of ISS commander, a job which requires a high level of responsibility for the station and its crew. Of course, a new part to my training is that uh, on my next mission I have the added responsibility of being the ISS commander and to me that's a great honor. So uh, I'm very humbled by the trust that people have in me to actually command this uh, fantastic space station. But of course, uh, it comes with a big responsibility also already in training. So that means uh, I'm right now not only responsible for my own training, like in my last mission, I had to make sure that I'm trained and I can do everything that people need from me uh, in orbit. And now I have a crew to take care of. Another key element of the returned astronaut's life is to impart their considerable experience in order to help train the next rookie astronauts. Matthias Maurer, ESA's newest astronaut, has been training with astronauts Tim Peake and Luca Parmitano, both of whom boast extensive EVA experience. It's actually a lot of fun because I can relate what I'm doing on the ground to what I did in orbit and it gives me perspective to how it's going to be while I train. And as a matter of fact, our feedback to the instructors is very well received because we can improve the training that we receive just by getting our experience into the equation. It's great to be back in Houston training again. I'll be in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory very shortly with Matthias Mora, the German astronaut, so my ESA colleague. Uh, really looking forward to that as well, um, trying to sort of impart some of my knowledge from my spacewalk uh, and to share my experience with Matthias. Uh, here in Building 9, of course, it's great to be back, uh, reminiscing about my time on, on the space station, but also learning about the new developments that are constantly changing on board the space station. Don't tether to this D-ring on the bottom, that's only for the battery. The other thing too is that you can shove this all the way in here and then this foot. I have so many fantastic images and, and wonderful memories of my six month mission to space. If I was to have to choose one highlight, I would probably say the spacewalk was the highlight. Just going out of the hatch and seeing space, seeing Earth, and looking back at the space station from inside a spacesuit, that really was another order of magnitude uh, over and above just the experience of going into space. You put your toolbox down here, and your toolbox will stay because the water will keep it and the gravity will keep it. In space, you put your toolbox down, you, you look back, and it's, it's gone, and, and it's flowing. up there, yeah. and it's all over the place. So, and all the tools inside your toolbox will all be floating around a lot more. So, the the, the microgravity is really difficult in space.
I was at the NBL uh, earlier this week and just seeing the suit up operations and seeing the uh, suited uh, uh, guys going down for their spacewalk training. Uh, it really brings into perspective what the realities of a spacewalk are versus the MBL. And you know, there aren't that many. The MBL really is a fantastic place to train for a spacewalk. It's the best place that we, we can train on Earth. The crew hook side. Yes, and actually this is a good opportunity and whenever you're heading out the airlock. All European astronauts get training on how to operate in a spacesuit, in the American spacesuit. And um, so we need to learn how the spacesuit works, how it functions, and also how difficult it is to work inside such a suit. It's very limiting and uh, like a work that takes us five minutes here on the ground, in space it takes me half an hour and afterwards my entire body aches and it, it's like, it's hard, hard work outside on the station. And you try to do hand over hand. And Matthias, you don't have to ingress the APFR, we could have drivers. I pause for a second to uh, figure out which... I hope that I get the chance to do a spacewalk because all my colleagues told me a spacewalk, it's, it's like the best experience of your space flight. Leaving the station, seeing the station from the outside and having a very clear picture of the Earth below you without being limited by a window, just looking through your visor. That is uh, yeah, the perfect image and, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm happy that I'm out of the water and that I actually can move my arms again, how my body is designed to move the arms because the, the suit constrains a lot of my arm movement. We thought it'd be a great idea. It yeah. kind of serves its purpose, but we found better techniques like yeah. safety feather pads. When you're in there in that position and you've got your grandpa daddy here, <laughs> you've got your grandpa daddy there like this, just even to see the unlocked I, I couldn't see it. It's good to just have one wire tie dedicated to a bunny and to it. Of course, you can walk into that and pop that up. Mine is. It is this direction here. I like the joint to be on top because um, you'll find in the pool you need this okay. to maintain your rigidity. Okay. Uh, this right now is in mortar, so in order to do the cal test, you need to either put it in retroclockwise or counterclockwise. There you go. Okay. A little different. Now you get your LED test, yeah. so now you know all your LEDs are working. Mm -hmm. Don't tether to this D ring on the bottom, that's only for the, the battery. battery. The other thing, too, is that you can shove this all the way in here and then on this foot. Okay. It's not new to you. You know that you're going to go ahead and stick your boot into the toe loop, put your heel down. Foot in, and then I lean backwards. When we were in orbit, we had three spacecraft come up. We had Cygnus, we had HTV, and ATV. ATV was all the way aft, and you have to cross all of the Russian segment in order to transfer cargo to the other side and it would really need some coordination with our Russian colleagues because if they're working, doing sport, then you're floating in the middle of all their activities. So it, it, the station does become a very busy place. Even in, chain, in, uh, in shape, there are modules that uh, are in a different position that compared to when I was up there, and uh, uh, the procedures have changed compared to when I was up there. Um, specifically, the emergency procedures and uh, all of the payloads are different. So all the training has to be done completely from zero. The seasoned astronauts still get a kick out of looking to the future especially when it comes to new equipment and spacecraft like the Orion capsule. Visiting the Orion capsule today was really exciting. It is the next stage in our space exploration. Europe is very much a, a firm partner in, in there. We're providing the service module for the first exploration missions, which is really exciting. Going back to the moon with a, a vision of using that same vehicle for some form of Mars transportation vehicle. Currently, we are flying to the ISS, but the ISS program will soon like, become to an end or it will become a commercial space station. On the other hand, we are also looking to fly much deeper into space. The ISS flies at 400 kilometers altitude and uh, with the Orion we can actually go into deep space. For example, to the moon, which is 400,000 kilometers, so 1,000 times far, uh, further away than the ISS. And uh, actually this opens 
a new perspective into uh, exploration. We will go to the moon and after the moon we will go to Mars. And there are lots of adventures, lots of science that we can do in deep space. Experience isn't the only thing astronauts bring back from space. Their biological specimens help evolve the gastronomical sciences. Here we are opening the samples we received from Toma, coming directly from the ISS. There are different samples of urine collected during 10 days of tests. Providing enough energy for the astronauts is a critical aspect of payload planning particularly for long-duration flights. The center will provide us with an inventory of all the food taken by Thomas up there for all the time of the exercises he made during the 10 days of our tests. Here, for example, we can see on this table the energy consumption of Thomas every day, how much he has spent. You can't order pizza to go in orbit, so the decisions about what to take with them can be critical for astronauts. Food is something that's really underestimated down here in the ground. Like people go like, oh yeah, I'm going to fly to space, so I don't care what food I take. It's not bad. Well, you start caring about that one month into the mission, and then if you made the wrong decisions, it's, it's, a, it's a hard remaining five months. This is mainly to trigger my memory for the food that I already had, and now I can make the choices based on how I remember them. And then there's a few new ones in between. For them, I have to sort of guess. There's still debate. The taste actually changes uh, the actual taste buds. People perceive taste differently. My personal opinion is we don't. I think it's the same. But the cravings change, and that is really hard to predict. Right now, I might not care so much for broccoli and cauliflower, but up there, I really like it. I, because it's, it's pretty protein loaded, what we have. We have a lot of uh, meat. And then I try to add anything that reminds me of something green. Let's put it that way. I mean, those beans, they, yeah. <laughs> they don't resemble the beans a lot, but they actually taste really nice. Oh, we didn't have blueberries last time, right? We had raisins. <clears throat> That stuff is awesome. Last time I got a few Russian bonus containers. They also have very, very good food. Their food is more succulent, like they have more, more grease in there, also more spices, also more salt, which is not so good for the bones. So I tried not to eat so much of it. The American food or the European food is, is more healthy, I would say. Uh, but once in a while it, it's really satisfying to just open one a can of this really... Uh, <laughs> succulent, savory Russian food, and I absolutely enjoyed it. It's really good. On my last uh, expedition, we tried to have the meals all together. The US crew, European crew together, uh, we always had meals together when, when we could. And then on the weekends, we would gather, like the six of us. Either the Russians would invite us to their segment, or we would invite them. And then we have the big table, and everybody brings something together, and it's kind of this medley. That's important. Uh, this, those are the relaxation moments. You can take your time, you put music on, and you chat about how your week went. And it's the last thing that I have for today, after a successful tasting of 48 items. With experience comes cooperation. ESA is now conducting astronaut training activities in China. Samantha Cristoforetti and Ruki Matias were each teamed with two Taikonauts, who between them have considerable spaceflight experience. We are basically practicing what would happen if there was an off nominal landing. We wouldn't land on the ground, but we would actually land in the water. And we would have to survive um, independently for some time and using the rescue boats and the rescue equipments and exiting, of course, the re-entry capsule um, autonomously.
After donning insulation and buoyancy suits, they practiced rescue procedures with both a ship and a helicopter from a mock-up Shenzhou capsule. Space missions can be unpredictable, and training exercises such as these ensure that astronauts are prepared for every eventuality. The training experience so far is great. The Chinese are really well prepared. It's a high-level equipment. We get helicopter uh, airlifting. We have a huge sea survival rescue ship, which is usually um, employed on the, on the high seas. So very good equipment and a, a very good experience so far. Accompanying Samantha and Matthias in China were an ESA flight surgeon and a training specialist who gained insights into the different cultural nuances and approaches. During this training, I have had the opportunity to work very closely with our Chinese medical colleagues, and I'm very, very impressed about how they have combined their traditional Chinese medicine, which has thousands of years of history, with the most advanced medical knowledge that we can find now in the world. Training here is very, very well organized. So we have uh, different ways of approaching training, which is inherited from the ISS program, but actually they are not that far away. So it means that we find common words and common understanding in the way they also organize this training. So for us, it's a very good sign for further cooperation with the Chinese. This training exercise wasn't the first collaboration between the two space agencies. In July 2016, Chinese astronaut Ye Guangfu joined ESA's caving course in Sardinia to experience an extreme environment as part of a multicultural crew. Both activities stem from the 2015 agreement to boost collaboration between ESA and the China Manned Space Agency, with the ultimate goal of flying European astronauts on board the Chinese space station from 2022. This joint training we are doing here is a first step in a cooperation that uh, we all hope will lead uh, one day in the early 2020s um, to a European astronaut flying with the Taikonauts to the future Chinese uh, space station. Uh, so, of course, I would be thrilled if I, if, I, if I had that opportunity. Organized by the Astronaut Center of China in cooperation with the Ministry of Transport's Beihai Rescue Bureau, this training session has been an important step towards long-term collaboration. Space flight opens up new horizons, not just for astronauts, but for nations as well. As you know, my last mission was called the Blue Dot. We focused uh, on the view back, the perspective back from space onto our little planet Earth as it, you know, flies through the black universe. Now, on the new mission, we decided to take a step further, to even view with a bigger perspective, to acknowledge that it's not only about our little blue planet Earth, but that there's much more out there in the universe. And uh, as the early explorers who sailed, well, beyond the horizon, towards the horizon, and even further, we named our new mission the Horizons Mission.